Lucy, and welcome to Travel Through Time. Thank you. It's wonderful because we're here today together in the same room in the beautiful surroundings of Lincoln College in Oxford. And I believe Lincoln is one of the oldest colleges. It was founded in 1427. Mm -hmm. But today we're not going to be talking about the 15th century. We're going to be talking about the 16th century and your magisterial new book, which is called Tudor England. And I wanted to kick off by asking you a question about the way that we divide up periods of history so that we can talk about them easily, because you do mention this in your introduction. And you say that Tudor England wasn't invented as a concept until years and years after Elizabeth Mm -hmm. died. So can you talk a bit about that? And, you know, is it helpful the way that we divide up history? Do you think sometimes it's done for convenience rather than actually fitting in with what went together? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. I mean, we have to divide it somewhere. I've just given out a bunch of reading lists to our our new students and they have to start somewhere. But the traditional cut-off, 1485, you know, the, the watershed between medieval England and Tudor England, yeah, it's not really very helpful. Um, and we would encourage our students and our others to, to keep thinking about, well, actually, what, what stays the same over that boundary line, not just what changes. And particularly, I mean, I'm going to be talking a little bit about Catholic England today. Um, and, you know, that sense of Catholic identity in the, in the 16th century was rooted in centuries and centuries of religious tradition. So they didn't think of themselves as having you know, a cut-off point. 1485, you know, quite the contrary. So, yeah, I mean, we, we have to slice history somewhere to make it kind of possible to serve up pieces at a time. But I think you should always bring into question that, that idea of boundary line. Yes, and also, as you say, emphasise the continuity, because the people that were living at that time certainly wouldn't have suddenly woken up on whatever morning it was in 1485 and felt like they were entering a new era, would they? No. No, they wouldn't, although the idea that with the death of one monarch and the accession of another, something fundamental has changed, I think did apply. And of course, we've just lived through that ourselves. And um, and I think a lot of people were slightly taken by surprise at just how big a transformation that that felt. Um, Yeah, so... So we may well look back on this moment that we're just living through now as being the end of one period and the beginning of another one. Well, I, I think in, in part, yeah. I mean, I had the most extraordinary experience, a really kind of poignant experience. I was sitting there writing something for a, a, an article and I was talking about an Elizabethan playwright, Thomas Decker, and how he describes the morning in London in 1603 when Elizabeth has died. And he talks about how shaken everyone is. And he talks about how, you know, people had never known another prince. And I was sitting here in this room, writing that, while all the bells of Oxford were tolling for the death of our Queen Elizabeth. And it was it was a really extraordinary feeling, actually. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a lot of interesting comparisons that can be drawn, parallels perhaps, between mm-hmm. the two Queen Elizabeth, and I imagine that over the next few years that will come out more and more as people sort of look back on Elizabeth II's reign and are able to assess it with the benefit of hindsight. Mm. You talk a bit in, in your introduction about how the Tudors were actually extremely, the Tudor monarchs were extremely preoccupied with their medieval past and especially in terms of establishing themselves as a dynasty and as having a, a, a real claim to the throne. So can you talk a bit about that? Because I think maybe that's not something which people are aware of. Yeah, I, I mean, in part it boils down to the fact that I think when we think of progress, we think of progress as being something forward-looking. You know, we want to you know, colonise Mars, find a cure for cancer, whatever it is. It, it goes forward. In the 16th century, when you thought about improving society, you were very often looking backwards you were looking back to the golden age that had passed. And in terms of uh, the Tudor monarchs, you know, they're looking back to uh, kings like Henry V, you know, the victories of the uh, Hundred Years' War, 
um, the kind of stability and strength that they perceive those kings as having. Uh, and they're trying to justify themselves very often by comparing themselves to their, their ancestors. So yes, you, you, would, you would often look back in time, whereas we in our century perhaps look forward. Yeah, but we do look back to the Tudor period. And mm-hmm. I know that this is a big part of why you wanted to write this book, because there's been a lot of um, television programmes and films in recent years which have portrayed the Tudor period, and in particular, um, Henry VIII. And you talk about there being this series, I really love this sentence, you said there's this series of clear, jewel-like images Mm. which we all have in our popular imagination, and how that's actually not nothing to do with the truth of what it was actually like in in Tudor times. And I wondered, wondered if you could talk a bit about that, because obviously it's difficult to communicate a very far away period in history Mm -hmm. in a a sort of light, entertaining way. And I wondered if you could just just enlarge on that a bit. Okay, well, I mean, to start with the clear jewel-like images, I mean, a lot of those come from the fabulous portraits that we have. And they were very lucky to have very great painters uh, to, to portray them. But of course, all of those paintings are also works of propaganda. They're all trying to create an image which covers up, a, you know, a much more complicated <laughs> truth. Uh, and I suppose, you know, going out from that, you could think about you know, some of the some of the way they're ways they're portrayed in films and, and novels and so on, as some sometimes not quite getting that. Uh, and it's great that there is this enthusiasm for the Tudors and you know I I love that there are these tv series and films and all the rest of it I mean some of them if you're a historian are a bit painful to watch Um, but uh, at least they're getting people interested and they're getting people talking so that's great but they sometimes I think just oversimplify and I think they also uh, have an exaggerated notion sometimes of how these you know, these, these Tudor royals, how much power they had. Because, of course, they're projecting this magnificence. And you, know, you look at the Holbein portrait of Henry VIII and you think, yep, he looks really scary. Uh, but they didn't actually have the kind of power that you might assume. You know, their, their rule was a kind of process of negotiation with the rest of society. They could only rule the country if the country agreed to let them. Uh, and so, yeah, some of the, the sort of intricacies of that, I think, are sometimes a bit lost to view. And we get this kind of soap opera about a really dysfunctional, rich family. And, yeah, you know, it can be fun. Uh, but it doesn't really do justice to what actually happened. I think it's probably difficult to strike that balance. And I don't know how, whether actual historians, what role historians like you play in the making of those TV series. So are there any, I mean, who knows, it's probably different for each one, but I, you just wonder how connected, you know, academic history and that kind of history is. And actually that, you know, if, if historians were employed as consultants on things like that, that would maybe help. I don't know. Well, we sometimes are, <clears throat> and you do sometimes get asked, and, and that's great fun. But, you know, I was once asked to comment on um, something about uh, the life of Mary, Queen of Scots, and they kind of sexed it up, you know, and added in all the... And the life of Mary, Queen of Scots does not take <laughs> any... Uh, yeah, you don't you know, need to add any really <laughs> sexing up. <laughs> you really don't. It's it's quite lurid and, and, and uh, astonishing in and of itself. So, yeah, I think we sometimes feel that if you paid attention to the, the historian's view of things, it wouldn't be any less interesting. No. Yeah. I think that's a very good point. So when you decided to write this book... How? What were your sort of parameters? How did you decide to to start? I mean, obviously, you wanted to do the Tudor period. You focus on England, and it is. I can't show the listeners, but it is a hefty book. It's <laughs> yeah, long. I'm really, really sorry about that. <laughs> no, but it's. I mean, it's a huge period of history, and it's okay. so rich and fascinating. Um, I really loved how you structured the book. So, can you explain how it's structured? Yeah, I mean, I was asked to write this book actually. Um, and I was asked to 
to sort of sum up where we're at with the, I suppose, with the historical work on, on this period. Um, and I really wanted to get away from the way that these kinds of books are often written, where it's a very trad, you know, top-down political narrative. Not that there isn't call for those books too, but there's been so much fabulous work done on the Tudors and on Tudor society in particular over the last, you know, 20, 30 years. And that often doesn't get integrated into this kind of book. So that's what I wanted to do. So the way it's arranged, there, there are 14 chapters and five of them tell each of the, the story of, you know, each distinctive brain. But then all the others in those chapters, I mean, I don't know if I've succeeded, but what I tried to do was bring to life the, the experiences of ordinary men and women and the landscape, the, the drama, the literature of the time, all of which is really interesting, all of which has produced extraordinary you know, scholarship over these years, but you don't get them all joined together very often in, in the same book. So that is what I've tried to do. And, and one, um, again, I don't know if I've succeeded at this, but one of the great things that has happened over the last sort of 20, 30 years has been really, really brilliant women's history. Um, and again, that often gets put in a separate book or, you know, at least a separate chapter. And it, the time has come for us to move on and actually write integrated history where women's history is, and I've hope, I hope I've done this in this book, women's history is tied in with the, with this, with the main story. Yeah, it's just part of what happened as yeah, it was. Exactly. So it's not the sort of poor relation. Mm. Well, it's an absolutely wonderful book. I particularly loved um, the chapter, which is called Landscape and Seascapes. Um, it was really evocative. And I think it's so important to get across the experience, as you say, of everyday people and what it was like to live in this period. Mm. Um, because it was one of huge flux. And that brings us very neatly to the year that we're going to be travelling back to today. So can you um, can you please tell us if you could visit a year in history, what would it be? Okay, so the year I have chosen is 1558, one of these moments of transition. And can you set the scene for us in 1558? What Roughly what is going on in England? Okay, so 1558, I mean, traditionally has been seen as you know, the, the end of this brief experiment to restore Catholicism under Mary I, and she, she only rules for five years. Uh, and Again, according to the traditional you know, view of this, it was a disaster. She was trying to put the clock back. She was trying to interrupt England's destiny, which was you know, moving towards its Protestant future. So 1558 has traditionally been seen as, as a rather sort of dire year. And it's true that there were some difficulties in that it was a really bad harvest that year. Um, there was an appalling outbreak of influenza. Uh, I mean, obviously, two to life is marked by recurring epidemics. That sounds a bit, that sounds a bit familiar, <laughs> doesn't it? But there'd been a particularly bad bout of influenza that year, so much so that they had trouble getting in what harvest there was because so many people were ill. And so Mary, just for our listeners that aren't that familiar mm -hmm. with this period, Mary had succeeded her brother Edward, yeah. who was Protestant, and yeah. there had been a real attempt to impose Protestantism on this country mm -hmm. and to do away with Catholicism. And then, of course, Mary becomes queen and she's Catholic. Mm -hmm. So the tide is turned back again. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those questions of history which has always really preoccupied me. And I I'm not a religious historian at all. I don't really know very much about the history of religion, but I always try and imagine what it would have been like for someone, a normal person living in a village in the English countryside in that period with those religious changes. And mm -hmm. your book brings out exactly that. So can you talk a bit about that? Like, How would people have felt? How, what would it have been like to be Catholic one moment and Protestant another moment? Or do you think that perhaps in the, you know, countryside, in, in far away from towns and stuff, it, would, it wouldn't have affected people so much? Well, I think that's, that's a good point. I think it varied a lot where you were in England. Um, and one of, one of the things I love to do is to go 
looking in old churches, I mean, I think probably all historians do this, and I suspect all historians have children who roll their eyes. Um, <laughs> yes, but, definitely. <laughs> um, if, you, if you go into any of our pre-Reformation churches, nearly all churches have a list of, of incumbents, of you know, the priests who, who were there of the years, and you very often see that the same priest who was there in, say, 1530, is, is still there 30, 40 years later. So not only have these communities to sort of work out what to do in response to these directives that are coming down from on high. And no, you can't have the Latin Mass, you have to have the Book of Common Prayer. No, you need to burn the Book of Common Prayer, we're bringing back the Latin Mass. You know, but they have to do it under the guidance of a priest who is possibly just as confused as they are. Uh, so it's very hard to get at a really comprehensive picture of how ordinary people experience this. Because, of course, remember, we're still in an age where the majority are illiterate. Mm. So they're not going to write down what it was, was like. But, um, but we have enough evidence to be able to see that some people were just deeply confused. Uh, some people were passionate about the new faith and were really excited about Protestantism. And you didn't have to be you know, learned and educated, you know, ordinary people too could see the appeal. Um, but equally, a lot of people felt devastated that their traditional faith was being taken away. And I think one way to think of this is very often in material form, you know, because if you can't read or write, you're more likely to derive religious knowledge from what's painted on the church wall and, you know, the, the precious things that are kept inside a church. And under Edward, a lot of those have been smashed. A lot of the rituals and ceremonies of the church here have been banished. So we have one fabulous source, um, uh, this uh, priest who is up in Adwick, the street near Doncaster, and he writes his narrative of the Reformation. And it's, a, it's a, an astonishing thing. And he, I mean, he's quite an educated man. You know, we, we, we know a little bit about what he's read and so on. But when he describes the changes... He's describing things like there, there are no palms on Palm Sunday. There are no ashes on Ash Wednesday. There are no candles at Candle Mass. So all of the, the, the rituals that people have been used to have gone. I mean, it's a bit like, you know, someone came and said, right, you can't have Christmas trees. Yeah. yeah. It must have been a, 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 a really, no matter how you felt about the religious thing, losing those traditions, which was so much part of the fabric of everyday life, must have been... Very difficult. I think it was shattering for a lot of people. Um, yeah, and one of the interesting things about Mary's accession to the throne in 1553 is that uh, a lot of these things, which has, had ostensibly been you know, destroyed, suddenly pop up again. <laughs> so people had clearly taken their their statue of their favourite saint and, and you know hidden it in the, in the woodshed or in the attic, and suddenly these things reappear. So. Although, on the whole, the Tudor population is quite good at doing what it's told, uh, not universally, because there are rebellions, but on the whole, they, they, they mostly conform. But I think there's quite a lot of passive resistance and, yeah, sort of concealing things in the hope that one day Catholicism would return. Yeah, and of course that carried on through for, for many centuries, didn't it? Yeah. After. Yeah. So um, let's go to your first scene um which is i imagine a, a drizzly day in november the 17th yeah. of november in london when this this terrible influenza pandemic is mm -hmm. raging um and uh, where are we going what are we going to witness well um two people died on november the 17th 1558 um north of the river in st james's palace and that was mary the first favorite um palace she is coming to the end of her life and she knew that her days were numbered so she received the last rites a few days before and she'd sort of been drifting in and out of consciousness and apparently she she told her waiting women that she'd had a dream of crowds of children singing like angels so you know she's 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 preparing and and she hears mass first thing that morning and then she sort of quietly drifts away south of the thames from lambeth the archbishop of canterbury reginald paul is also coming to the end of his days. Uh, and 
uh, Mary dies around seven in the morning, he dies around seven in the evening. And they try to keep word from him that the Queen has died, but a servant lets it slip. And he weeps, and, but he says, you know, Mary will be in heaven by now. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's obviously, it's a, it's a sad day. Um, it's also a real tipping point for this country, because that marked the death of Catholic England. It's and an it, astonishing coincidence it's, it's, it's that they died on the same day. Yeah, too. the symbolism of, of them both passing away on the same day. So much rested uh, on that. I mean, it could have all gone very differently. Just a few months earlier, Mary was convinced she was pregnant. Uh, she wrote a will. A high-born woman would usually write a will in expectation of possibly dying in childbirth. So, but she writes this will, and it's clear that you know she's envisaging her child, inheriting, and she's giving instructions accordingly. Um, so yes, just a few months earlier, everything was you know looking hopeful, but she adds a codicil to her will just you know a little bit time before uh, she dies, and it's clear that she's you know, she's given up hope. And, uh, and do we know what she died of? Uh, of the influenza, I think. Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to diagnose. Yeah, of course. <laughs> across the centuries, but that seems to be what carried her away. I mean, flu today can still be a killer. Yeah, um, and particularly back then. And she had had that wasn't the the first sort of phantom pregnancy, if you can call no, it that, was she's it? She's had another one. Because, um, I mean. It's it was so important. Yeah, you know, um, people people talk a lot about uh, sort of gender and power and what it was like as a as a woman to to rule England. Of course, she was the first woman to you know actively rule England. Um, and I think we sometimes forget that in the sixteenth century they had much more sophisticated and fluid notions of gender than we might think. And there really wasn't a problem with a woman exercising authority. If you look across sixteenth century Europe, you know, loads of women. Are ruling countries, but there is a problem when it comes down to biological realities, because you have to pass the throne on mm. by a line of succession, and if you can't produce that all important heir to the throne, I mean it's not just a problem that afflicts women, because if you think how much Henry VIII, yeah, you know, was was preoccupied with this problem and how he almost literally moved heaven and earth to secure a male heir, you know, it, it's a problem that monarchs face. Uh, but yes, Mary was, was you know, so desperate to have the child that would secure her Catholic restoration. Um, there's a very moving bit when she first comes to the throne. She's um, in her late thirties, and they're trying to convince her that yes, she can, she can still have a baby. You know, it's a bit late maybe to have a first baby at the end of your thirties, but you know, it's possible. And they round up various London women who had their first baby aged, you know, 37, 38, and say, look, they all managed it. You can do it too. Uh, which I think is such a, you know, kind of sweet moment. Yeah, that's a charming detail to have left. But do you think, because for a long time she was known as Bloody Mary mm -hmm. and the way she was judged was certainly misogynistic and you, you mentioned that in your book that, you know, mm -hmm. she was kind of condemned for being everything. There were so many contradictions. And so how do you think her reputation should be reassessed? Her reputation was really shaped by the kind of frantic struggle of Elizabethan Protestants to assert the credibility of their church. Right? And of course we think of well, you know, the Church of England established in the centuries. In Elizabeth's reign, it's new, it's raw, it's not very kind of coherent and it's not very co convincing so their their ba you know their, their greatest asset really is being able to paint mary as a persecutor and of course the nearly 300 people who died for their faith under mary you know become the, the kind of leading figures in, in john fox's book of martyrs mm. that's not actually what he called it he called it the acts and monuments but it's always known as the book of martyrs because of the focus yeah. Are, are on those deaths. Um, and of course, everybody persecutes. Um, yeah, it wasn't just the Catholic time. It's not, it's not just Mary. And in fact, one of the reasons why so many people were persecuted for their faith under Mary is not just because of top down directives, it's because 
the community as a whole very often reported these people. Yeah, so yeah. They, you know, there, there was quite a lot of feeling against them. But but Fox's work kind of was the thing that first defined this notion of, of Mary as a disaster and you know as, as wicked and, and persecuting and crucially unpopular. Yeah. You know, things like, well, of course they could. God's providence was against her. How can anyone speak in her favour? So th- that was the kind of first blow, really, for Mary's reputation. And then, of course, England, in, after 1603, Britain, uh, becomes a Protestant nation. And that Protestantism becomes really closely bound up with its, uh, you know, its imperial vision. And, uh, you know, it becomes a, an absolutely central part of the British state. So... And it sort of defines itself against Catholicism, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, to begin with, it defines itself against other Catholic powers in Europe. Mm. Um, obviously, chiefly against Catholic Spain, to begin with. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that it, it became part of the, the DNA, if you will, of, of um, you know, the, the British nation after that. Um, so, so fascinating. Yeah, so poor old Mary... Um, has always had this really bad write-up. And it's, it's a really fascinating example of how historical reputations work. Because, of course, that's all been challenged in recent work. Um, but I've never forgotten teaching uh, a visiting American student um, who said that when she was growing up, uh, that as children, they were you know, told, you behave or Bloody Mary will get you. No, really? Yes, yes. late 20th century America. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? That is amazing. Now, she and didn't horrific. really know who, Ma- who no. Bloody Mary was, but you know, she was the bogeyman. <laughs> right. yeah. Wow. So now I think we should go to your second scene, and I believe we are pushing against convention, and we're going to go back in time instead of forwards in time. So where where are we off to? Well, we're going just a few days earlier, and we're going to a dinner party um, at Rocket Hall um, near Hatfield, just a few days before Mary died. And uh, this is uh, a a dinner where Elizabeth, who by now is the acknowledged heir to the throne, uh, meets with uh, the Count de Ferrier, who is Philip II's envoy, and kind of right-hand man. Uh, And... Ferrier is a really interesting individual. I mean, like all politicians, he's you know, a bit of the edges. He's, <laughs> he's got an agenda. But he does seem to have been quite a nice guy, as, as these people go. And interestingly, he's one of the few people to, to make a match with an Englishwoman. There aren't many Anglo-Spanish connections in the, the brief time that Philip II is King of England, but he marries Jane Dormer, um, who is one of uh, Mary's ladies-in-waiting. In fact, one of her close friends. So, so he's he's an interesting. And do you think he marries her because he genuinely loves her, or is it yeah. a yeah? Both of their families were slightly aghast, but apparently she was very beautiful. She was clearly very loyal, um, and uh, just yeah. So they get married after after Mary has died, and she becomes you know the Countess of Ferrier and a leading figure actually uh, in protecting Catholics who have to go into exile under Elizabeth. Uh, and quite a sort of, you know, a mover and shaker in, in, in Spanish political circles as well. But yes, it was clearly a love match, uh, which is, you know, which is nice. Um, so Ferrier has come to talk to Elizabeth, and, and he says that they clearly had a whale at the time. He says, during the meal, we laughed and enjoyed ourselves a great deal. Um, and we have all of this because he writes a very detailed report back to Philip II, and we have a copy of this. But we don't have the original. We think the original perished in a shipwreck, actually. Um, but we, we have a copy. And so he, he reports that after the meal, uh, Elizabeth dismisses everybody, um, apart from just a couple of waiting women, and they have a private conversation. And this is what Ferrier is reporting back on. So he is there to manipulate Elizabeth. Yeah, he's there to... To lay the ground for the marriage proposal, possibly. Or... Possibly. <coughs> certainly to make her feel that she owes Philip II a lot. Um, so he... You know, lays it on very thick about Philip II's brotherly love for her and and he also tries to make out that she owes her position as heir to the throne to Philip's influence. He says you know, it was Philip who talked Mary and the council around um, 
Um, and you know, in, in the manner of all politicians who are sort of stabbing their former allies in the back, he he actually says that he had condemned the Queen and the Council severely, you know, in his conversation with Elizabeth. So he's saying, you know, you owe it all to Philip II. Um, but the really fascinating thing about this dispatch is it is totally obvious that Elizabeth is running rings around her. <laughs> you know, she's she's not being taken in by any of this. So she says very coolly back that, uh, oh, she owes it to the support and love of her people. Thank you very much. No, not to Philip II. Um, and even though Ferrier is writing this, I mean, he's got to make it... Make himself sound good. Yeah, exactly. He's got to save face. He's got to make himself... Well, I keep doing a good job to his master. He's several times on the defensive, and it comes through even in his sort of doctored account of, of, of the conversation. And it, it's just fascinating to see... I mean, she's, she's you know, in her 20s. She's untried, untested. She's only just survived the previous reigns. You know. But you say untried. I mean, she has spent her whole life managing to survive and managing to, hasn't she? I mean, she her childhood was just uh, yeah. extraordinary. Unthinkable. Really. Yeah. Yes, but she hasn't yet had the opportunity to operate at the political level yeah. quite like this. Yeah, no, no, sure. Not, not quite yet. And, uh, and it's just brilliant to see her doing this. So, for example, there's one moment where Ferrius uh, assuring her that all the people in England who are in Philip's pay, you know, it's all his clients, will all be on her side, you know, that Philip has told them that they are all to support her. And so he's obviously waiting for her to feel you know, how, how, how thankful she is. And she very kind of uh, calmly takes the wind completely out of his sails by saying, yes, I would like a list of those people. I wish to decide whether it is appropriate that they should be receiving for the second money. And it very actually says in his report, I'm quoting here, the way in which she said this rather took me aback, although I pretended that I had not perceived her tone. I bet he didn't pretend well enough to keep it from her. <laughs> I don't think she was fooled one bit, though. No. Uh, so, it, so she's already almost acting like a queen. Oh, yes. Yes, I think she is. And he, he gives his impression of her. I mean, he says she's a very vain and clever woman. How and dare she? <laughs> I think that's a Spanish diplomat's way of saying that she totally outclassed him. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, a bit later on, she's asking about the money and the jewels that Mary gave to Philip. Uh, he says, she said this with a certain air of authority. Well, yeah, I bet she did. <laughs> and she was famously parsonimious, wasn't she? I mean, she didn't like to spend money on anything that... She no. wouldn't have wanted to lose out on well, those jewels. Well, she had to be careful. Mm. You know, there wasn't, there wasn't money to no. spare. So, um, yeah, so it's very interesting. And then there's this one crucial sentence. And he says, she is determined to be governed by no one. And Prophetic words. Absolutely. And... It, if you look at what he, he also says to her, because at one point he, he tells her that uh, everyone expected her to prove herself a very good and Catholic princess. And then he warns her that if she abandoned God, then both God and men would abandon her. Right. So that kind of telling her off, telling her to be a good girl. You know, as soon as she's on the throne, she gets the Protestant equivalent of that. She gets all these men giving completely unsolicited advice. I mean, some of them, to be fair, she asks for advice, but quite a lot of them she doesn't ask. But they give her advice anyway. And again, it's be good, listen to your advisors, do what God intends. I mean, they have a slightly different interpretation than Ferry. Of course, but they're all using God as a way of threatening her, their type of God. Yeah, exactly. And she spends her entire life not listening Mm. too hard to this. You know, she will be governed by no one, as Ferry has worked out. And... And she fights her corner. And so the reason I think this, this conversation on this, you know, this, this dark November evening is so fascinating is because she's doing what really she has to then go on doing for the rest of her reign. Yeah. She is fighting her corner. She is embattled. She is surrounded by men trying to tell her what, her to do, what, what she's to do. Um, but she is by far the cleverest person in the room. Yeah. And do you think that at any point Philip II was thinking he would take over the throne of England for himself. Well, that's always a risk with the royal marriage. Uh, and it, we know this because when Mary married Philip, she produces a very, very detailed, careful marriage treaty explaining that 
basically he has no rights in England. Okay, so prenup. A prenup, exactly. Yeah, yeah. and she's she, it, you know, she uh, is. She knows she's doing very well with this marriage to Philip II, contrary to how it's later been viewed. I mean, you know, he was an amazing catch. And had they had a child, that child would have had the right to rule both England and the Netherlands, which would have been, you know, this is this is England's great trading uh, yeah. partner. You know, it would have been a, a, a real uh, uh, achievement. Um, and Philip got nothing. But he's so desperate for the English alliance um, because he needs to have at least one side of the English Channel on his side um, to, to maintain sort of sea communications with the, with the Netherlands. So um, he puts up with it. But we're told that he took a private vow saying, I'm not going to abide by any of this. You know, he was really irate yeah. about this marriage. Thing. I think one of the saddest quotes I've ever read in my life was in your book where it's Philip II commenting on Mary's death. And he mm-hmm. says he felt a reasonable regret. And it, that just seems yeah. so sad for her, yeah. so sad. But we must we must move on to your third scene, which is, again, further back in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, so where are we going this time? Well, we're just going a few months early. I'm sorry, this is stretching my remit slightly, but we're going back to 1557. Don't worry, we have elastic years. Okay, well, that's, that's good. Uh, my third scene is, is, the, is a book. It's a publication of a book. Uh, and the book is The Works of Sir Thomas More, Sometime Lord Chancellor, written by him in the English tongue. And where was it published? It was published in London in 1557. Yes, so this book is published in English. It's published in English, yes. So one of the things that's often said about Mary, quite unfairly, is that she didn't make use of the printing press. That you know, It's often said that the, the printing press was, was used by Protestants, not by Catholics. Um, now, the reason we say that is because Protestants at the time very loudly clamoured that God had invented the printing press for their purposes. But if you think about it, the printing press comes to England in the 1470s. So for at least the first 50 years of print in England, the books that are being churned out are all Catholic books, and and a lot of them were devotional uh, texts. So um, Mary makes full use of that. So the, the, the output of printed books during her reign is really, really interesting um, because they're putting forward quite quite strong sort of uh, Catholic uh, works, but but also works which are open to reform. You know, this is the thing that, you know, Mary was not a reactionary. She was a very highly educated woman. Uh, And in fact, interestingly, one of the, the key texts of the Edwardian Protestant Reformation to accompany all the English Bibles There's this book by uh, Erasmus, the Dutch humanist, and it's called Paraphrases uh, on the New Testament. And it's been translated into English by a team of translators, one of whom is Princess Mary, later Mary I. So, you know, it's one of the great ironies of the English Reformation that this key text for the Protestant Reformation of Edward's reign was partly translated by his sister. Well, and also good to know that Elizabeth wasn't the only educated intelligent woman in in that family because mm. that's not something that you is Ma- mary's famous for is it you don't when you think of mary tudor you don't think of someone who's particularly well educated and we should because she was yes formidably well educated and also spoke lots of languages and also had you know, this classical learning um and that that whole theme of educated women is something that we also find in this book because although it's by thomas more and it is a collection of his various works written in English. It also includes translated translated works by Mary Bassett, his granddaughter, also very learned, translated uh, lots of lots of interesting, lots of, lots of rather you know serious uh, uh, academic works. Um, because he promoted the education of women, didn't well, he? Well, this is, this is one of the things about Thomas More. Now, Thomas More's reputation has ebbed and flowed over the years, and I think has, has, has been on a bit of a downward curve recently. But he is such an extraordinary figure. And it doesn't do justice to him to regard him either as the kind of you know, the, the narrow-minded persecutor, which he is from a Protestant point of view, or really as the Catholic saint that he emerges as uh, um, in 1935 when he's canonised. I was surprised it was so late. I had no idea that yeah. he was canonised so, so mm-hmm. late on. I don't know why. I sort of assumed it would have happened 
possibly in Mary's reign, actually. But Well, he was certainly viewed as, I think, a saintly figure right from the word go. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and the fact that you know, they keep relics of uh, things he owned and... and uh, yeah, um, he's he's got already um, the makings of a saint, I think, quite early on, even though he's not formally recognised as a saint later. Um, but he's such a, an extraordinary figure. So the education of women that he's really passionate about, his daughters, you know, his granddaughters, they're all a formidable bunch, um, is, I think, partly reflected in, in this work in which they're involved. Because... The, the cult of Thomas More was very much a family business. And, and one of the features of this book that I've chosen is that it was published by William Rastell, his nephew. And I think, you know, we, we often look at the Reformation and all these, you know, religious animosities in the 16th century, and we, we think about them in terms of doctrine. Do you believe in transubstantiation? Do you believe in justification by faith? Like this kind of thing. We need to think about them more in terms of human experience and human connections, because as the Moore family shows, you know, Catholic loyalism, in this case, was very much the family business. I mean, a lot of uh, Moore's descendants are recusants, they go into exile, they join um, convents, they join the Jesuits, um, and... Even more than that, I think what I find fascinating about Moore's vision of his religion is how much it's about community, how much it's about the, the you know, ties between people. The Dutch humanist Erasmus, who I've already mentioned, he famously said of Moore, uh, friendship he seems born and designed for. No one is more open-hearted in making friends or more tenacious in keeping them. Really lovely. Yeah, that's a great. I've said about it, isn't it? And, yeah, and I think I think we see that in in a lot of his written work. Um, I mean, there isn't time to talk about his most famous work, his Utopia of fifteen sixteen, because that's a whole other. That's a whole other. That's a whole other podcast, if you like. Yeah, um, and, and you know, we've been debating it ever since, and no one has actually yet agreed on exactly what was going but on. But surely there. that I mean that is evidence of your point is that he was the kind of mind that can produce that kind of work has to be mm. one of incredible complexity and subtlety and not yeah. someone that you can put in a box. Absolutely. You can't put it in and a I box. And I think to talk to your point about religion and looking at religion from a very doctrinal point of view, I think that's so important because it, that that's just the sort of official version of it. But of course, everybody had their own mm -hmm. relationship with God and with religion in that period. And those individual, especially with a man like Moore, of a man of his intelligence. That's the fascinating part, is being able to see inside his mind and see how he saw his relationship with God. Yeah, and I mean, it's often said that he, you know, he died for the papacy, uh, which I think doesn't even begin to describe it. He died for Christendom. He died for the ideal of a Christian community that was not divided. And I think if you... I mean, the thing that stands out for me from his utopia is his real passionate advocacy of social justice. He, you know, tears into these idle rich people who make it so that you know, the, 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 the poor are starving and then when they steal a little bit of food, they get brutally punished for it. And he's saying, you know, how can this possibly be defensible, this level of inequality? This, yeah. is, this is what he feels so angry about. And, and the bit from the book that I wanted to quote... It comes from his defence of purgatory, a book, a book uh, called The Supplication of Souls. And I always think that this is a real insight into how Moore worked, because I mean, he's defending, on the face of it, a not very lovable doctrine. I mean, purgatory is quite hard to prove out of the Bible. We know it was abused with the sale of indulgences and so on. Also, it would have been awful to be in purgatory, wouldn't it? Well, depends how you look at it, because, of course... You know, if you say to anybody, do you think you're good enough to go straight to heaven? They'd probably say no. Mm, Even if you said to them, are you bad enough to go straight to hell? They'd say, oh, I hope not. So the idea that you, you go somewhere to be cleansed first, you know, that, that there, was, there was a comforting side to the doctrine. But what I find fascinating about Moore's depiction of it is he writes it as if the souls in purgatory are calling out to the living. 
and he describes them as you, your late acquaintance, kindred, spouses, companions, playfellows, and friends. Uh, you know, so it's it's a human appeal from these people. And if I could, I'd like to read just a little passage from the end of this. Please do. Uh, and again, it's it's voiced. Uh, you know, it's as if these people are speaking, and they're saying to the living, "Now, dear friends." Remember how nature and Christendom bindeth you to remember us. If any piece of your old love, any kindness of kindred, any care of acquaintance, any favour of old friendship, any spark of charity be left in your breasts, let never the malice of a few pestilent persons raise out of your hearts the care of your kindred, your old friends, and all remembrance of all Christian souls. So, why he can't bear Protestants is because he thinks they're going to come and they're going to tear the fabric of society apart. You know, they're going to divide and, and stir up hatred and animosity. And that's why he's so passionate an advocate. And he was so right. I mean, the... Well, certainly the, the thousands of people who died in the name of religion in the centuries that followed. Fascinating man. Maybe you should write a book about him next. Oh, okay, I need to take a break. It's a really, really long book. And, you know, I'm not, and I'm not sure my family... Um, <laughs> they might disown me if I turn to another woman. Um, well, I have one final question, mm-hmm. which is um, a much easier one to answer, I hope, which mm-hmm. is if you could have picked something up from one of these places that we've visited mm-hmm. today, what would it be? Okay, so my favourite portrait of Mary I... Is one by Hans Eworth. We're not again. We have to be a li- little elastic with the time here. We're not entirely sure when it was painted. It may have been a little earlier in her reign, but it's an incredibly beautiful portrait of her, and she's wearing some very extravagant jewellery. And one of the things she's wearing, she's wearing it um, on a sort of chain dangling from her belt, and it's a reliquary. It's a medieval reliquary made by one of the great Parisian goldsmiths. And it was acquired as part of a ransom during the Hundred Years' War. So it belonged, uh, we know it belonged to Henry VI. Um, you know, you can sort of trace its its life story. It pops up in a jewel book of Henry VIII in the 1520s. Um, and it's described as being damaged. Well, Mary clearly had it mended. And it's got, it depicts the four evangelists. And it was said to contain a fragment of the true cross, a drop of Christ's blood, and relics of St. Catherine and St. Nicholas. And it's a beautiful thing, but it's also a kind of testimony to that that Catholic continuity that she was trying against all odds to to sustain um, in that, that year that we've been looking at. And it's also a kind of embodiment of how how people sort of saw material things as having sacrality, as having, you know, a, a kind of spiritual element. Um, and also in practical terms, uh, it vanishes uh, from then on. We, we think perhaps Elizabeth had it destroyed. So I, I, I'm not taking anything that anyone wanted. <laughs> no, I think that's a great choice. And I can see that there's a space above your mantelpiece here, the way you could hang the painting. So I think that would be... Oh. Fantastic. Um, and I love this. St- is that the only depiction of the reliquary then? I think that's the only depiction we have. So yes, no, rather than the portrait, it's the reliquary itself that I would like. You want the reliquary itself? I want the reliquary. Okay. That's all right. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I've really, really enjoyed our conversation today. It's just been wonderful to find out more about the Tudor period and to be able to look at it from a much broader, richer viewpoint. Thank you. No, thank you.